Been gone, and a top five tight end was moved. Uh, two players named Chase are rel- wait, was it my right? Chase Edmonds, yeah, yeah, two Chases were moved. That's right, <laughs> they were on the case. Chase Edmonds and Chase Claypool on the move. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Today bonus show. Sorry about that. Let's talk about the winners and the losers here. Hawkinson to the Vikings, <clears throat> uh, Chase Claypool to the Steelers. Chase Edmonds to the Broncos and as part of the Bradley Chubb package. Bradley Chubb going to the Dolphins. Uh, Jeff Wilson also to the Dolphins. Uh, Calvin Ridley to the Jaguars. William Jackson to Washington. That's a cornerback. Uh, no, Pittsburgh, sorry. From Washington to Pittsburgh. And just before the deadline, Naeem Hines going to Buffalo. All right, Jamie. So big winners, big losers. Let's start on the winning side. Uh, the winning side would be, I like Naeem Hines going to Buffalo. I think that's a good move to help his fantasy value, given how the Bills use their running backs and what he should be able to do for their passing game. Unfortunately, bad situation for James Cook, and we'll see what it means for Devin Singletary, but I think you got to view him as a loser. Um, the winners, Pittsburgh receivers have to be winning. Pittsburgh in general, just great day for them. I mean, to get a second-round pick for Chase Claypool and to get William Jackson for, I know they got to pay him, but still the compensation, not giving up much, um, is, is a pretty good you know, bargain on what he could be in that defense. Um, Kirk Cousins, big winner, getting a, a weapon like TJ Hawkinson. You know, that's a good situation for him, for his fantasy value moving forward. Um, Got to say Justin Fields is a winner, right? Getting a, a, a better upgrade at the receiving core. You know, that's a nice situation for him. Um, yeah, I guess you could view Amara St. Brown as a winner, Josh Reynolds as a winner, you know, just taking TJ Hawkinson off the field. You know, that should free up a few more targets there for them. Yeah. So, and then... You know, some small winners, I think. You know, you look at Jeff Wilson is uh, is a winner going to Miami. You know, he's an injury away now from being fantasy relevant again. Clearly, that you could have said the same thing maybe in San Francisco, but Elijah Mitchell's impending return, you know, probably would have made that a messy situation should Christian McCaffrey, you know, miss any time. Um, Chase Edmonds is a small winner. You know, now he gets a chance to play, uh, hopefully, um, in Denver. So there's there's a lot of different ways you can go about this, you know, just looking at it. I think the biggest winners, though, for me would be the Steelers receiving core, Kirk Cousins, and now you mind. Okay, and I think a uh, Darnell Mooney loser. Slightly, you know. I I think you know you want to see how this this works because it, it goes two ways for me. One, yes, he could go from the number two, the number one to the number two, um, in in the Bears offense. But you would have to hope, which is what we see when teams do this, is they're trying to beef up their passing game, right? They're trying to make it you know where they're going to throw the ball a little bit more. So. If he's five, six targets in a low-volume passing attack with Chase Claypool, he's awful. If he's six to eight to maybe six to ten targets, eight to ten targets in this offense because they're throwing the ball a little bit more, then I think he's a slight winner, to be honest with you. Well, you're giving him more targets now, so you're saying they're going to throw the ball more. Um, I'm okay. hoping. I'm not yeah, saying I'm hoping. Like Claypool, Claypool is going from one of the worst passing teams in the NFL to the – maybe I shouldn't use the word worst – but the least prolific passing team in the NFL. No team throws fewer times or for fewer yards than the Chicago Bears. So hopefully that will change and they throw the ball a little bit more. But obviously you want Justin Fields running. He's better as a rusher than he is as a passer. So Claypool is someone who is available. Uh, 60%-ish rostered. And like, does he become a waiver wire priority for you now? Um, Would you rather have him or Josh Reynolds, who is also about 65% rostered? And and Reynolds is the red zone and green zone target leader for the Detroit Lions. They lose the guy who was second on the team in those two categories. St. Brown's had some injuries or he'd probably be ahead of them. But, but, you know, would you rather have Reynolds or Claypool right now? I think I'd rather gamble on Claypool's upside, you know, just to see what happens there. Because he could be the number one receiver as opposed to, you know, Reynolds still being the number two guy. Um, if not, you know, maybe the number three guy, if Jamison Williams ever gets on the field. So, you know, I, I probably would take a chance on Claypool, but I can see where you're going with Reynolds. You know, hopefully this frees up some things for him and makes him a little bit more attractive. Do you drop Chase, uh, Chase Claypool? Do you drop him for, you know, someone you really like on waivers like a Josh Palmer or a Rondell Moore? Or is this a, a big enough boost for him that we should hang on? Oh, well, I would hang on to see what happens. I mean, we, we, we've been, we sat here for the last two weeks. You know, I know Heath. Um, said two weeks ago in terms of Justin Fields, the schedule, you know, the, the bear schedule is very favorable, you know, so how quickly he gets on the same page with Justin Fields is going to be the interesting part of this, you know, so I reordered the, the, the list, uh, a receiver, you'll, you'll see an updated version of, of the waiver wire for what we talked about from, from Tuesday morning. Um, 
So the reordered list of receiver for me is still Rondell Moore one, Josh Palmer two, uh, Romeo Dobbs now three, um, Devin Duvernay four. Uh, I put Darnell Mooney five and Claypool six. You know, so I still oh. would pick up Mooney ahead of uh, Claypool just because again rapport, familiarity, all those things. You know, and again the hope would be that this goes from a twenty three to twenty five pass attempt type of scenario on a good day to a twenty seven to thirty maybe pass day on 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 a you know better day. So we're improving, you know, I, I butchered that, but you know, how that yeah, they improved, yeah, gotcha, the, gotcha. you know, throwing the ball a little bit more and keep in mind, you know, they just traded Roquan Smith. They lost Robert Quinn. They're going to be in situations where they're probably in some shootouts. Now their shootouts are typically Justin Fields running the ball, but now you have the better passing attack, better weapons on the field to help the passing attack. So hopefully that's the chase, the, the, the case for uh, the Bears, you know, when it comes to the, the volume in the passing game. Did see some Paw Patrol costumes yesterday, so I think that's why I butchered that whole chase thing earlier today. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's talk about TJ Hawkinson here. So he actually, just statistically, is getting a downgrade in passing offense. Jared Goff is averaging 272 yards per game. Kirk Cousins is averaging 247 yards per game. We're talking 25 fewer, it's like more like 24 fewer yards per game, but we're hoping that that improves for Cousins. He said an extremely inefficient, almost career low, 6.6 .6 yards per attempt. We know he's better than that. Um, the touchdowns typically favor Cousins quite a bit, though. He's usually a 30 touchdown guy. Goff's been 19 to 22 touchdowns in three straight seasons. It is kind of weird to look at the tight end standings and see Hawkinson as tight end five per game in PPR. One game. I know. And it was, it was against one game, and it was against the worst team against tight ends in Seattle. So I was considering dropping him. I, I have Schultz and well, I can't drop him this week because of Schultz on, on a buy, but um, I, I didn't really value him as a must have tight end, uh, even though tight end so thin. How do you, do you think this is any better for him? Any worse? And how do you value Hawkinson? I'll give him a slight upgrade because we know that cousins in his history, not necessarily in this offense, but you did see, you know, the last two games, they've thrown two touchdowns to their tight ends week seven against Miami, excuse me, week six against Miami. Then they're buying week seven. Uh, Irv Smith scored against the dolphins. Week eight, you know, Johnny Munn scored against the Cardinals. So maybe there's some things that are evolving there with their with their tight end group. Um, you know, there's now no more uh oh, another trade. Wow. Um well, Zach oh, Brandon Cooks was traded. No, not That's... not traded. Sorry. Oh yeah. Zach Moss that... was traded for Naeem Hines, by the way. Yeah. Brandon Cooks was not traded. Oh, I like that from from Moss. Um so I think you know, you look at uh you look at Hawkinson, you know. The touchdown potential may may help him. I, I think ESPN stats and research, they tweeted out um, Cousins has the lowest QBR of the 33 qualifying quarterbacks throwing to his tight ends this season. Now, you know, take that for what it's worth. Or I'm sorry, maybe he's 30th of 33. I don't know. He's near the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, take that for what it's worth because, you know, Irv Smith missed the start of the season. Who knows how long it took him to get fully healthy. And then this offense just has a lot of mouths to feed. I kind of just think he's the same. You know, he's going to be a guy that'll pop up. With a productive game every now and then, he'll be in that low end starting range of Evan Ingram and you know now Hayden Hurst, and you know maybe slightly worse now, but similar to how we've kind of viewed Gerald Everett, you know, uh, just a slightly uptick above the above the streaming guys, you know. So someone good enough to use will have a big week every now and then, but you'll be largely probably more frustrated than not because of what the expectations are. Would you drop him for Evan Ingram? Probably not just to see what happens, but I would drop him for Gerald Everett if somebody dropped Everett. Okay. Uh, let's talk about Raheem Mostert. So Jeff, well, they've shared a backfield before these two, and this is going back to 2020. There was a four game stretch late in the 2020 season where Mostert and Wilson split carries almost evenly, and they were both on San Francisco. And one thing that's interesting here is that Mostert has been more of the third down back in the Dolphins offense. But back then in 2020, he had he in those four games where he split evenly with Jeff Wilson, Mostert ran zero routes on third down. Wilson ran 18. Jarek McKinnon was there. He ran 17. So I wonder if Jeff Wilson has an impact on Raheem Mostert. I think you could probably say that he's he's an upgrade over Chase Edmonds. Edmonds not having a good year. Um so let's talk about the two backfields here, the Dolphins and then the Broncos. But you know, how do you, you – Raheem Mostert's the number 19 running back in PPR over the last five games. That's when he really started getting his consistent 14-plus carries per game. Uh, you know, do you think he's still a number two running back? 
You think he's worse now? Talk about the Dolphins, then we'll move to the Broncos. I think it's probably slightly worse for him, but you know, I, I also think that he's established himself as you know such a significant piece of this Dolphins offense. Um, he's been with the team, the rapport is there, he's got a better work, he's got better work in the passing game, I would think, than Jeff Wilson, who's never really shown that. I just ability. said that they, they favored him, they favored Wilson over Mostert in the passing game two years ago. Yeah, but I I guess it's fair. I guess I just want to see it first. Um you know, Mostert's been making plays for the Dolphins in the passing game, you know, and so that could be a Shanahan versus McDaniel thing. You know, who knows how, how that unfolds? Um, Fight. <laughs> Shanahan versus McDaniel. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I do think, though, this is a win for Wilson because he was headed to Disastersville in San Francisco with, with Elijah Mitchell coming back. Now he's an injury away from being the starting running back for a very explosive offense. So if you're asking me uh, of the running backs who were dealt, I would rank them Hines 1, Wilson 2, Edmonds 3. Like, I, I just think that Wilson's got lottery ticket upside. He's got the potential to work in tandem with, with Mostert. Um, in terms of Mostert, I just give him a slight downgrade. Like, I don't think it's going to impact him for this week because who knows how quickly Wilson gets up to speed. Um, you got to figure that there's a, a lot of familiarity because the, the language is probably the same in the playbook. Um, but still, you know, I think Mostert will still be worth using as a number two running back. And until he doesn't prove to be a number two running back, I think that's when you start to pivot away from him. Any impact on the Broncos running backs? You think Chase Edmonds cuts in even more and now it's a three Oh, I would drop Melvin Gordon at this point. You know, I, I think going into his bye week, Latavius Murray's been better than him the last two weeks overall. Um, you could drop Murray too if you want to, just to speculate that Edmonds, you know, could be the guy there. But it feels like this was just the throw-in. You know, the Dolphins saving some salary on their end, you know, to get rid of Edmonds. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to impact the cap. But, um, you know, Denver probably just searching for some answers there. You know, not not being thrilled with two guys, you know, in, in their early 30s or Gordon 29, whatever, um, to see if Edmonds can become the guy. But, I mean, you kind of know what Edmonds is at this point, right? You know, he couldn't couldn't make it work in Miami. Never really was consistent in Arizona. Is this Denver offense with how they've been running the ball without Jamonte Williams going to make him into a you know star player? It's hard to say. So crowded backfield, I would say, you know, probably one to avoid. If, if you want to speculate on any of them, it's, it's Edmonds. You think so? I mean, you know, Latavius Murray's been been a touchdown guy. So, better than Gordon. I don't know. It could go it could go one of three ways. At this yes, it point. could. Uh, who's the handcuff for Jonathan Taylor? I would say it's Deion Jackson. You know, I, and I think he's somebody worth worth that. You know, I'd probably take him at this point over uh, Edmonds. I put him after Wilson. You know, we saw Deion Jackson have a 10-catch game. In the in the game where uh, against Jacksonville Week Six, when both Naeem Hines and, and Jonathan Taylor are out, I would imagine that if something happens to Taylor, we'll see a, a, eventually a, a shared backfield with Zach Moss and Deion Jackson. But they clearly like Deion Jackson enough to make this move. So you know, Jackson will probably absorb the minimal production that Naeem Hines is giving you. It's just it's just wacky that he's only has 28 targets, 25 catches. Hines did, you know. So granted, you missed some time, but I, I think Deion Jackson can you know end up being in that three to five catch range and. You know, maybe end up being as a low end flex playing PPR. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I'm looking at the chat right now. And I think there's a little bit of buzz on on Zach Moss, and I just don't really. I. But to do what though? Uh, to be the handcuff, you know. To uh, well, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm I'm probably just looking at a few comments and and generalizing here, but I I would think Deion Jackson would be ahead of Zach Moss. This is not. I would be shocked if he's not. Yeah, this is not an earth shattering. Oh my gosh, I got Zach Moss kind of deal. It was. It was a, maybe a throw in. This he, is an upgrade for him fun. because probably, now yeah, he gets it's a an upgrade for him. Yeah. Huh? It's probably right. It's probably an upgrade for him. Well, he gets a chance to prove himself on a new team. And, you know, God forbid Z Jonathan Taylor does miss time, you know, then he's going to get more work. But I'd be shocked if he's not headed for another few healthy scratches. I really hope that Naeem Hines doesn't ruin Devin Singletary because there's just. I hope he does. <laughs> you do? Yeah. And we're going to have two useless running backs. Well, I hope he ruins him to the point that he's better. But how would he be better? I, I don't think he's going to take the carry. I, I totally agree with you, but I just you're just talking to a guy that drafted a lot of nine lines. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the only chance you have of having a Bills running back be fantasy relevant is the guy gets both the rushing and the passing down role. And that was the case. Singletary is the, he has the second most catches on the team. He has 23 catches. Moss and Cook have combined for 12. Hines could very well get those catches now, not get the carries, and you've got just two useless running backs, just like it's always been in Buffalo. That, that could I, I, I honestly, though, I, I would like to see what Naeem Hines could do in a feature role in this offense. Okay, because and last, well, yeah, I mean, that would be... I what? think just based on how he catches the ball, 
I don't think he's necessarily more explosive than Devin Singletary or even a better running back than Devin Singletary. So I think Singletary gets a, a, an unfortunate knock um, for kind of how he's been pegged. But, you know, this, this, is, this is a telling move because they started to play James Cook a little bit more. Devin Singletary's obviously done some nice things. You know, it's getting them a, a – I don't know what the compensation was fully. I think it was a six-round pick, something going back one way. Um, so they probably didn't give up a lot for it, plus throwing Zach Moss in the deal. But, um, man, with Josh Allen and this offense, he could be a lot of fun. I'll see if I can get that compensation here. Um, all right, let me ask you this. Deontay Johnson and George Pickens and Pat Fryermuth. Is this a big upgrade for them? Chase Claypool had 50 targets. I mean, that's no – that's second on the team. Deontay has 76, Chase Claypool has 50. It wasn't super productive, but this is a pretty big deal. And I also want to say before I forget, Chase Claypool was running pretty short, you know, short routes for him. His A dot. Yeah, yeah. His A dot was way down this year, and he's at his least productive by far this season. Um, so now he goes to a team that averages more air yards per pass attempt than almost any other team. Justin Fields is a deep, deep thrower. Get him on the outside, maybe he can become more efficient because he's just been, he's just been crap with his targets this year. Um, but that's, that's the topic, I guess, for another show. So um, I don't know why, but <laughs> could be a topic for this show, but for, for Pickens and for Johnson, losing the number two guy in targets seems like a big deal on paper. Uh, at the very least, you can't drop them now. Right. And then, right. So you were, you were on HQ with, uh, with me and Heath on Monday and Heath's topic for believe it or not was all the Steelers wide receivers are droppable on their bye week. And you brought up the point, which I thought was valid, that they didn't have a concentrated offense to funneling their targets. I don't know exactly how you phrase it, but I know that's what you meant. Exactly. So yeah. now you have, hopefully, those three guys operating like what we tend to see from top-tier wide receivers and top-tier tight end. They're not the upper echelon of guys, but they certainly have the potential to be, if Kenny Pickett can be, you know, something resembling what a, what a developing quarterback and maybe eventually what he can become, you know, featuring these guys. So, yes, I think the, the it's not like the target volume hasn't been there for Deontay and at times for Pickens. So it's hard to say, like, they're going to see that much more work. But maybe this just opens up more opportunities for them in some key situations, some short yardage things, which have been beneficial for Deontay Johnson during his, you know, breakout run the last couple of years. Maybe it helps George Pickens a little bit. Maybe it helps Najee Harris. You know, I mean, maybe now some of those targets go his way. And we see him be be back in the good graces of uh, in the passing game that he was uh, like he did with with Ben Roethlisberger. So everybody wins in Pittsburgh without Chase Claypool there just because there's more chances to touch the ball. All right. Gone round and round here. Um, fun day. You know, I glad the NFL trade. You know, that got laughed at. I'm going to tell Dave and Heath tomorrow. They scoffed at me a little bit when I said the NFL trade deadline is something now. Nice, something like that. And they were like, what? Like, eh. You know, 15 years ago or whatever, we didn't have a day like this. This didn't no, exist. No, this is like the NBA. Yeah, this is not, you know, it's not quite MLB, MLB and NBA, but it is It is getting better. And maybe one day it will be. It just keeps seems to, to get uh, more exciting. So, Oh, another trade. Another What's trade. That? Nah. Right at oh, the deadline. Oh, Chiefs, that's the Chiefs. They traded Rashad Fenton to the Falcons. That is weird. Fenton was a was a really important player for them. So I thought, I mean, the one game they played without him recently, maybe they played two games without him. His replacement got absolutely torched. I can't remember. It was a primetime game, whatever. As that's a starting cornerback going to the Falcons who really need a starting cornerback. Um, all right. That's pretty interesting. And of course, you know, we look at the Dolphins as one as this incredibly easy matchup now for quarterbacks. Well, their pass rush just got much better. So we'll have time to talk about that as we take a look. At um, one other trade we should discuss for dynasty purposes, the Calvin Ridley trade. Oh, um, yeah, thanks. You know, going to the Jaguars, uh, and it's I think it's a great move by Jacksonville because you know you get you get him. There's a lot of incentives built into it. He could you know go as high as a a second round pick if they sign him to a contract extension. I wonder what that means. Like if he signs a one year deal, is that considered a contract extension? They got to give up a second round pick. Um, but in, in any event, um, clearly Atlanta moving on. You know, we had the what what ends up being a really stupid suspension because of what he did by comparison to a lot of what other players have been suspended for, you know, uh, gambling on, on, on a game, um, you know, shouldn't have done it, but I don't think the penalty, the, the penalty. I, I think the punishment fit the crime. You do? Well, I just think that I know what he did is not anything compared to, you know, people who have committed, you know, the, I'm not even going to say it, but we know, but 
you just cannot gamble on the sport. The, yeah, the, but the integrity of the game is I get it. You have to do that. You have to let everyone know that any type of gambling of any kind will not be tolerated at all. I, so I understand like, you know, for Deshaun Watson to not even have a year suspension, although he did miss all of last year and for Ridley to be, I get it. It looks hypocritical. It looks, it looks weird, but I also understand you got to really, really make sure no one ever even considers gambling on the sport. If he's anything close to what he was, which is hard to expect. I think he will be 31, right? If I'm not mistaken. Or no, my, my... Uh, maybe I, I, th- I think 29, 29 or 30. Let me, I'll tell you right now. Here. Keep talking. I'll let you know. You're looking it up. Yeah, look it up. <laughs> I was going to compare him to. to oh, I'm my... sorry. He'll be 29. You're right. Um, it's going to be so... just like Thomas. Basically, he's going to be out of football for essentially two years, coming back at the at age 29. Only difference is he's not injured, really. And in Thomas. Right. So if he's right, you know, we were just having this conversation, me, Dave, and, and Pete Prisco. How many teams have a number one receiver, like a true number one receiver? Not in, and, and this team's a good example because Christian Kirk, you wouldn't think of as a true number one receiver, like an alpha Justin Jefferson, Cooper Cup type of guy. So could Calvin Ridley be that if he's right? You probably put him in that category, right? Wouldn't you? He's, he earned that, I think, two years ago. I don't yeah. know what happened last year, but he earned so, it two years ago. To take a chance on him and hope that he can grow with Trevor Lawrence and, and work with Kirk and – uh, what I think will probably be Zay Jones. I think Marvin Jones will be gone by next year. So that's a pretty nice receiving core with with if they bring back Evan Ingram also. And so we'll see what that means for Trevor Lawrence. So I think he gets a boost dynasty wise. Calvin Ridley, somebody that if you have a team that's um, contending, and I'm sorry, if you're a contending team looking to trade Calvin Ridley to a non contending team for something that could help you now, that's probably a move you should make. Okay. We got another show tomorrow. We'll tell you all about Heath and Dave's thoughts on these trades and uh, trades you can make as well. As we are in the second half of the fantasy season. Thank you. No, to no, Jamie. no, not yet. Mm. Half time of next week. <laughs> okay, okay, that's fair. Or maybe like after the one o'clock game, Zed. You know. Uh, thanks to everybody for hopping on. Good stuff here uh, for, from you in the chat and from Jamie. I'm Adam. Talk to you tomorrow on Fantasy Football Today.